Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Nine-time Emmy Award-winning soap scribe Patrick Mulcahy is here today to take a look back at his incredible career writing for many of your favorite daytime dramas. Patrick has written for Another World, Briefly, Texas, Guiding Light, Twice, Loving, Santa Barbara, General Hospital, and The Bold and the Beautiful. He has written two short-lived primetime series and two movies of the week. He earned his first Daytime Emmy Award working side by side with the legendary Doug Marland on Guiding Light. Forty years after his start on Search for Tomorrow, Patrick left The Bold and the Beautiful at the end of 2019. And right now he's enjoying the North Cascade Mountains in Washington State, where he lives quietly and happily with his husband, also named Patrick Mulcahy. We have so much to talk about today, so let's get started. Please welcome to the locker room, Emmy Award-winning writer, Patrick Mulcahy. Did I get all that right, sir? Thank you. You left out <laughs> Search for Tomorrow. Uh, oh, I left out Search for Tomorrow. Well, that's where you, you did begin. Yeah, that was my first job. That was my first job. That is where it all began. Yeah, you know, it actually began when I was started... I was living in uh, New, New Orleans, Orleans. Yeah. yeah, and uh, a bunch of uh, young people from, of course, they were the same age as me at the time, uh, <laughs> from LSU walked into this little art gallery where I was working. I was the director of the art gallery, which meant that you know, I swept the floor, I hung up the paintings, I poured the wine at the openings and stuff like that. And they said, we would like to do a play here. And I said, okay, why not? Because they were going to pay rent. And once and they did, I realized these people are really good. I also real they realized, oh, this guy is a writer. And the head of the troop, there was only four or five of them, um, said to me, this is great. You can write plays for us and we won't have to pay royalties. <laughs> and I didn't know I couldn't do it, so I did it. Um, and we actually did very well. We got a grant from the Louisiana Arts Council, and we were doing plays in the Louisiana Public Schools. That was the trip. Um, what initially I, brought you to New Orleans? That, that I had to um, take little roles, like I played the, the player king in Hamlet and... Antigone's boyfriend in Antigone. Um, what brought me to New Orleans? I, well, when I was a teenager, okay, uh, when I was a teenager, I told the wrong person that I thought I might be gay. Well, homosexual, I don't think I knew the word gay. And I wound up committed to a, a adolescent psych ward for two years until I was old enough to sign myself out legally. If people in your audience don't know that that used to happen all the time, maybe they should. So uh, as soon as I set myself out, they were threatening to take me to court because I thought it was a danger. Well, it was a danger to them because I knew I shouldn't have been hospitalized. So I misbehaved. And um, <laughs> As soon as I got out of there, that was in Connecticut, in New Haven, where I was going to school, um, I abandoned uh, I abandoned Connecticut. I stepped them out and hit my Provincetown, Massachusetts. I didn't really know much about being gay, but I knew there were gay people in Provincetown. I knew it required special clothes. So For Provincetown? I, well, being gay. Oh, oh okay. Yes. Okay. Better than ordinary sense. clothes. And so I thought <laughs> I'd go find out how to be gay. And of course, there is no way. To, <laughs> there is no learning how to be gay. It's only learning how to be you. And um, wow. while I was there, I uh, met some people and who said, come live with us in New Orleans. It sounds so, it, it's so much fun. You'll love it there. And I did love it there. It was a great place to have a misspent youth. Okay. Hey, so Patrick, your your internet is sort of going out. Are you far from it? No, I shouldn't be having problems. 
maybe you're moving if if you yeah, I don't know. Because I it, there were moments it's going in and out, but I, I do know one of our fans, Floyd, just said it, it was having trouble. Um, uh -oh. But I, I hear, you know, there's clarity in, in a lot. So let, let's just continue. Just try, you know, maybe you're moving a little or I, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> it's the internet. I, I don't have the answers when it's that. Um, well, let me check my uh, audio settings to make sure. No, it, it, I think you have the right settings, but I, I just think the connection seems to be. Um... That could be a big storm here today, as we do frequently in the Pacific Northwest. So, yeah, I, I apologize if there's wobbling. Yeah, it, it might be wobbling. I, I will definitely. Um, Patrick, this um, story is incredible about um, you sharing that you think you might be gay and, and somebody having you admitted. Um, well, my parents had me committed. Wow. Did you, were you able to repair that relationship? Well, this was the advice my parents gave for this doctor. I was foolish enough to, after I had my first um, sexual experience with another man, um, I thought maybe like, oh, I'm an artist. I, I can be very um, bohemian about this, but I immediately recognized that it was bigger than I thought. Right. So I went to some shrink there at Yale New Haven um, Medical Services, Health Services, and the shrink said, uh, well, you know, do you dress up in women's clothes when nobody's around? And I was even more ignorant about homosexuality than he was. So I, you know, just said, no. Uh, do you want to be a woman? No, I don't. Do you, are you attracted to me? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I think you're uh, basically okay. And we can uh, take some steps to make sure that you're fine. You don't seem effeminate. Right? This guy was so ignorant. Um, so I went back to my room and a couple hours later, these two security guards showed up and said, Dr. So-and-so would like you to come with us. And I did. And they took me to the 10th floor of Yale New Haven Hospital to the adolescent psych ward and locked me up there for two years. Um, so I, uh, and meanwhile, crashing confidentiality laws all over the place. He had called my parent. Hey, he Patrick, ho ho can you hold on? I'm... I'm going to kick you off. Will you just reconnect? Oh, I'm sorry. We're having trouble again. Still. A little. Let's just try the reconnection. I'm just going to kick you off. So all you have to do is do what you did and come back on. Okay. We'll do. You'll see yourself disappear and then we'll start. We'll see if it fixes itself. It sometimes does. I've always so. wanted to the ability to become visible. Go ahead. Thanks for letting me know, Floyd. Um, happy Thursday, everybody. Um, what a fascinating story from Patrick. I, um, as a gay man, hearing this story is uh, upsetting, to say the least. Um, upsetting, to say the least. Parents need to listen to their children, support their children. That's all I will say. Hello there, sir. Let's try again. Okay, sorry about this. That's okay. Um, it just sometimes corrects itself when we, you know, it's the internet. So no, no worries, no I'm worries. Having no trouble hearing you, but okay. Okay, good. Does this seem better? Or? Yeah, it does so far. Yep, I haven't heard any. Um, Mark was asking, what year? Do you recall what year they committed you? How long ago? Seven. Uh, One seventy-two, maybe. Okay. Um, anyway, so I wanted I wanted to get as far away from Connecticut as I could. I went to New Orleans and um, did have a great um, 
time there in my 20s. And writing these plays, um, I was also teaching, I was like one of the writers in the schools. If you remember that program, there was a thing called CETA programs where they hired um, actual artists and writers and dancers and actors and so on uh, who didn't have education um, degrees, but let them come and teach and, uh, what they did professionally in schools. And so I did that. And as it turned out, I taught Bill and Joyce Corrington's son. And I guess they saw one of my plays because this call came out of nowhere. Um, how would I like to write for Sir for tomorrow? And yes, said, and, and your response? <laughs> I said, sure, what is it? I didn't even have a television, so I didn't know what I did. They And they were very, uh, Bill and Joyce were very, um, well, Joyce was who I was talking to. She was very earnest with me and said, you must watch the show for at least a month to get the voices of the characters. Well, I didn't have a television, but I did have the the school I was teaching at had a the fourth grade where I was the fourth graders I was teaching had an AV room so I would go there at lunch hour which is when search for tomorrow search was, was yeah and um I watched a few episodes and I thought arrogant SOB that I was um <laughs> what's the big deal they sound just like they look so <laughs> so <laughs> So actually, they liked my first couple of uh, sample scripts, which is like completely illegal by the Writers Guild, but I didn't know that then, and they probably didn't either. And they hired me on at, at Search. Um, and the Corintons, what a what a amazing couple of characters. Uh, Bill was um, Shreveport guy. He was also a lawyer and he had a PhD, taught English for a while, but he was a very serious and really kind of inspired writer, novelist and poems and short stories. And he was fast, man. He was well suited to daytime. Um, but he had a serious back problem. He had chronic pain all the time, practically lived on Percocet and bourbon. Um, which you would think would make him mean. And he was, he could be difficult, but he, he was great to me. And um, well, he was one of those guys who, one of those faux redneck guys, because, you know, he had a PhD in English and stuff and he loved Proust, for example, but he would like talk about faggots and queers. And uh, and in those days, you know, I did what we all did, which was like, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, and just change the subject. So um, Joyce was uh, a chemist. I believe she had a doctorate in chemistry. She was from Texas. They met at Rice University. A um, chemist? <laughs> yeah. And she, wow. I mean, she kept a little pistol in her cowboy boots. Um, but she was the one that kept the trains running because she was very disciplined. And she would... She wrote all the outlines. She paced the story out that way. But it, she didn't think of herself as uh, poetic. She thought of herself as a workmanlike person who could make the story make sense. And that's how they kept going. Um, they, we were working with Mary Ellis Bunham at the time, who was the producer yeah. of... of uh, the Search late for Mary Ellis, Ellis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was also really nice to me. Um, I, I said, we all didn't first, really get along. This was your first show. So yes. what do you think you learned from the Carringtons and Mary Ellis? Um, I learned from Bill that good writing is good writing. Don't write down to your audience ever. Don't, be, don't try to make yourself a lesser writer because you're writing for something that's uh, frequently ridiculed, like soaps. Um, well, I'll tell you the most important thing I learned. I, I was, um, 
after leaving that hospital, you know, I just had no faith in anybody. I just was going to be completely dependent on me. And I was not going to believe other people. I was not going to censor myself. I was just going to try to figure out how to have the life I wanted as the person I wanted to be. So good for, like, good for you, Patrick, because that is something that I, I don't know a lot of people would have the strength to do after that. Anger. That's my secret strength. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so my, like my fourth or fifth assignment was just awful. Our heroine, who's, I think her name was, I think the character's name was Sunny. As yeah, Marsha McCabe. Yeah, Marsha McCabe. Yeah, yeah. Um, was supposed to get drugged by this nefarious guy who, and he was taking dirty pictures of her in a French maid's outfit. It was just so ridiculous and awful. I mean, that Jeopardy, women in Jeopardy and women in sexual Jeopardy was such a trope in the 70s and 80s. Not that it's dead now, but uh, it was. So I called Corrington's thinking, no, I can't do this. And um, I don't know if it was one of their kids that answered or the maid or something. And they said, oh, well, they can't come to the phone right now. They're working. I thought, well, OK, I'll go over. So I went to the house. Well, they were in a meeting with the P&G people, um, Gail Kobe, and I think Bob Short was there. Um, maybe we can talk more about him sometime. But uh, so I went in and Bill was very kindly introduced me. Everybody, this is our new writer, Patrick. You've seen his work, blah, 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 blah. So Patrick, what's on your mind? And I said, you know, I, I'm going to get fired for this, I know, but... <laughs> I, I can't write this. I think it's terrible. I think it's just appalling. I wouldn't want to watch it, and I don't want to write it. There's this dead silence around the table, right? And then suddenly Bill pipes up and says, you know, you're absolutely right. What would you like to write instead? <laughs> wow. So I thought, oh, uh, that was the most important thing I learned is that the person who can name the thing that everybody in the room is thinking gets to be in charge for a moment, right? Or the person who knows what stinks and what doesn't. So I never made the mistake that I think so many writers and probably actors and every people of every persuasion do and just shut up when I knew we were doing something really wrong. Mm -hmm. It did account for a certain amount of obnoxiousness that I, I own today, and I am sorry that I was obnoxious to so many of the people that I worked with, but I was not going to do stuff that I was going to be ashamed of. There is a reason you are a nine-time Emmy Award winner, Patrick. <laughs> um, I, I would like to... Two things. Um, Candace, early when we started talking said that she was so excited that you were here today. She has her notebook and she is ready for Soap Writing 101 today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing is because you were breaking up, I did ask you, and I'm, I, I think the, the fans would like to know, did you, were you able to repair your relationship with your parents? Uh, well, Once your father calls you a queer, it's kind of hard to come back from. I tried, I did understand that given who they were, their generation, their own upbringing, they would never contradict a priest or a police officer or a doctor. So the doctor said, your son is sick, I can help him. And I'm sure they said, what do you think, doctor? Um, it took a, a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't think my father and I ever really um, mended the gap, but I did with my mom. I, I completely, you know, my dad never knew I was gay before he passed away. You know, my mother knew probably I, for 10 years before he passed away. He, he was a different generation and I was definitely too afraid to share it. So you know, I understand 
understand it. And I'm really sorry what you had to go through. I mean, I, I can't, you know, as a gay man, I can't imagine that. And I am so sorry you went through that. Thank you. However, I think maybe I met my natural peer group with the other inmates of the psych ward. There were, um, yeah, that's a- You that's learned from each other? Oh, they were great. There was this one guy, this 15 year old black drag queen from Bridgeport, <laughs> Connecticut, who uh, I know his name, but I won't say it. Okay. I, I've, been, I've been looking for him ever since I got out of that place. He, he was so wonderful. He just was completely unimpressed by the doctors, the big name hospital, the 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 big meetings that they gave name. Uh, he he just he um, wanted to use his drag name. Of course, today's we'd call him transgender, but at the time he said he was a drag queen, um, and he wanted to use his drag name Cherie, but they wouldn't let him because they thought you know that's not on your birth certificate and. And he found the linen closet where they kept all the linens. It didn't have a lock on it. And he would dress himself up in like a, a surgical gown and a cap and walk around feeling like an empress, but looking like somebody about to have a kidney removed. Um, but he kept us all very entertained and very sane. Good. You, I'm sure you needed it. I'm sure you needed it. Well, let's dive back in. You know, you, you worked side by side with one of the masters of the genre, Doug Marlin. You yeah. Know, speak, speaking of what you learned from people you worked with, what do you think you learned from him? Oh, Lord, I learned everything from Douglas. Uh, Douglas, see, I, from search, um, we transitioned through another world. The taxes the Koreans were creating. Then they all fired, except for me. Uh, well, in those days, the structure was you worked for the head writer, so your paycheck came from the head writer. I, I have to, I have to interrupt you there. That was something that totally blew me away when I did my research about you. I had no idea at that time that's how you guys were paid. Yeah, well, you know, and if you think about it, it accounts for a lot of the difference in the way so it's used to be and the way they are now. Writing writers got hired as a team. The producing entity, whether it was the network or Procter and Gamble, hired the head writer, and the head writer hired his or her own writers. So, if you pissed off the head writer and they threatened to quit, they would take everybody with them, and the show would be in trouble. So, the a, a writer then had a lot more power than they do now when they treat us as interchangeable you know, cogs in the machine. Um, you know, I don't know why I got into that. Oh, because uh, the everybody got fired from Texas, but Procter & Gamble said, we'd like you to work with this man, Doug Marland, who lives in New Canaan, Connecticut. And we will move you and take care of you. But first you got to go meet him and make sure it's okay. Douglas had never had an outline writer. He had always written all the outlines himself. Wow. I know. He was he was amazing. He would just get up, have his coffee. I don't I don't know if you sleep if you if you do all that. You would think, but he <laughs> he would type an outline as like he was doing a typing test. I mean, he would not pause. He would have it. It would just come out, right? Um so he'd sit down and do it in the morning, crank out an outline, maybe an outline and a half, and then have dinner and a scotch and uh, do some entertaining and go to bed. Um, he was quite an incredible powerhouse in that way. We met, we got along just fine. Um, and my duty was to, I found a little rental place in Westport and I would show up in his kitchen every morning at 8 a.m. And um, he would start talking. And we, it took us a while to figure out how to work with each other. Um, I was by far, of course, the much more the junior 
member of the group of the uh, team. And uh, so at first he would be acting like he was giving me dictation, which probably helped me some at the beginning, but I, you know, I had my own creative impulse that I wanted to honor. So I got bolder and he, 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 as, as brilliant as he was as a writer, he was a terrible teacher. It was just terrible. He, the way he taught me to write an outline was he held up this big yellow pad, right? The big yellow legal pad. And he, up at the top, it said, teaser. And at the bottom, and then it was one, two, three, four, five, six, X six. And each one would have like three lines and the teaser would say, Roger pulls a gun on Holly. And at the end, the last line would say, Roger falls off a cliff. And then he would say, this is verbatim. He actually did say this. And all you have to do is fill in between. Oh, <laughs> That's all. <laughs> fill it in. Wow. So I said, oh, yeah, okay, sure. So um, <laughs> we had a, a we developed a, a, a thing where he would, because um, he never didn't have an idea. He always was a fountain of ideas. And, but I was the one that works because so I was kind of like a bit of an editor to his idea machine, although I can't tell you he ever had a bad idea. Um, I think as a soap fan, you know, you know, he had ideas because, you know, the, sh the shows that he, he wrote were just so rich with story. And the characters, he was just so deeply um, committed to creating people that felt real, parts that were actable, dialogue that was speakable. And from Douglas, I learned that, you know, bad dialogue could be good dialogue if there's little enough of it. And that's the truth. I still like to polish my dialogue more, but uh, it, it can work. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've read, sorry, there was a bug that just went by me, but I, I've, I've read, you know, so many um, comments about, you know, daytime fans and what they think of your, you know, they think you truly are one of the best dialogue writers. Um, <laughs> Speaking of dialogue, is there a, you know, a favorite um, dialogue that stands out in your mind that you, you know, of your career that, you know, di dialogue is so important. Is there something for you that was, you know, you feel is like aces? Mm. No, I, I can't really say that. I, I feel like I... I feel like I put in a lot of um, apprentice time with Douglas on Guiding Light. And when I when I left Guiding Light, this uh, in, um, PNG had a problem. Uh, Hold up, because you you are cutting out right there, and I want to make sure we all hear. It. So PNG had a problem at that time. Is that what you said? I, I said that Douglas uh, left Guiding Light it's pretty well known that he and Alan Potter had a big dispute over the firing of Jane Elliott. Yeah. Um, and Douglas was furious. About it. it didn't really, I still to this day, I don't really understand that. I mean, uh, in two years, we had exactly one note from Alan Potter on one outline. And the note was, could she be carrying a Raggedy Andy doll? And the response was, sure, why not? So that was about Nola. And uh, so I don't know where this huge, uh, there was always a, a, a bit of tension. Oh, Lord. I, mean, I think of the, we went to Tenerife to do a scout for a remote shoot there back in the days when you could actually do that. <laughs> And um, it was uh, Mike was Mike Bauer was chasing Alan 
Spalding, who was getting away with something heinous. Um, and Mike was his father-in-law, right? Yeah. And so Mike was going to be on a horseback chasing him through the wilds, the the desert spots of Tenerife, which isn't that big, but, you know, on the camera it looks big. Um, and he's catching up to Alan, catching up to Alan, catching up to Alan, and then suddenly a helicopter appears out of the blue and lets down a rope ladder, and Alan climbs up and escapes. That was the plan. Um, so the PNG guy that was with us was like very nervous. Um, he was conferring with Alan, and they were saying, gee, that helicopter is going to be so expensive. And so the PNG guy pitched this Doug, how about instead Alan's running, running, running through the desert, and Mike is on the horse, chasing, chasing, chasing. He's getting closer. He's going to catch him. And out of nowhere appears a big blue Mercedes Benz. <laughs> and Alan gets in and escapes. Well, Douglas was not having, Douglas did not take that very well. And there were like conflicts like that pretty frequently. He um, was a gentleman, but boy, when he was, when he was crossed, he, you would know it. He, he wasn't happy. He was not abusive ever. But do you remember he, your first Emmy win with Douglas? What what that was for? Sure. Yeah, I, that was for um, the Nola Kelly Floyd Morgan. Brilliant, uh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That was the uh, the climax of that story, and it was it was great. And that was all Douglas. You know, I was like I said. Like to, I was the only writer that he ever had, but at that point, but, um, I don't want to say that I was driving the train at all. It was Douglas's show, mm. uh, and that was a just an incredible um, storytelling feat. What he did in that story, and you know where they came from. At least this is what Douglas told me. Um, he used to acknowledge that he's a terrible liar. He said, they always told me I was a terrible liar as a child. Now they tell me I'm a great storyteller. <laughs> a terrible liar, but a great storyteller. Yeah, well, the, the terrible liar morphed into the great storyteller. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but he said that uh, he asked his niece, her name was Tracy. See, this is another thing. He and I grew up in the same part of the world. He grew up in a little farm town, so did I. Um, the solar families. Uh, I remember once his mother uh, drove into, uh, his driver was taking his mother to the airport and we were dropping off at a, we were being dropped off at a meeting with P&G at the Carlisle Hotel, you know, a very swanky place in uptown mm -hmm. New York. And uh, when the car stopped, him and me, it's a big, she looked up and down the street. We're in front of the hotel. And then she goes, okay, run! <laughs> so that we wouldn't get murdered between the car and the door of the Carlisle Hotel. So that was kind of how my parents were about New York City. And uh, anyway, we understood each other pretty well that way. But he told me that he had asked his niece, Tracy was her name, uh, his sister Barbara's daughter, um, what her favorite romantic story would be like at her age. She was 16 or something. What would be her dream story of a thing that could happen to her? What would be the most romantic thing she could think of? And she was at the pool, he said, on the diving board. And she said, it would be that the cutest boy in school would notice me and only me and have eyes for only me. And then she dumped off the diving board into the pool. So that, he, he swore that was the genesis of the Morgan wow. Kelly story. Well, he, he was the hottest guy in school for sure.
I can't. Uh, you're gonna have to repeat what you say because I didn't hear that. Oh damn! I'm really sorry. I, we That's okay. have very good internet. Yeah, um, it, it can be the storm. I, I just, I mean, John Wesley's ship was definitely the perfect actor for that role. Well, I was just asking if you'd ever interviewed him. He's not only a great guy, but he and Douglas were very tight. I would love to. He has uh, unfortunately not uh, not said yes yet, but I'm not giving up. So, well, he was around longer than I was. I ended up moving to California. You know, after we did uh, New Day in Eden together, which we ended up calling Nudie and Eaton um, because they wanted somebody to be naked every 15 minutes, twice every half hour. Um, well, what they really meant was women to be topless. Right. I think it might have been Jack Wagner's first job because if we could see men's butts on Showtime. It was a Showtime series. And at first we got the note that, you know, Mr. Wagner will not do such and such. Then later on, we got the note, Mr. Wagner wants to know why nobody wants to see his butt. So I think we, <laughs> did, we did get Jack Wagner's butt on New Day in Eden. It was a terrible show, but. That, that's very funny. I read that father and son relationships were really interesting to you. Is that a true statement? It is. It is. I and have issues with my own father, as you've already heard a little. Of. Yeah. Well, that that's definitely understandable now. Um, so, so what was it like writing for Mason and CC on Santa Barbara and Liam and Bill on Bold and the Beautiful? How did you know? How did you bring maybe your your relationship or you know that fascination with father and son relationships into those relationships? Well, somebody once wrote, I can't remember who it is now. It's kind of a famous writer, but it's the name slipped out of my head. That um, conflict between fathers and sons is, uh, it, is eternal and unavoidable because one party wants independence and the other wants power. Uh, and I don't think I really brought my own issues with my father into those relationships that you just described with Cece and Mason. Um, I just was looking at that dynamic. Um, and, you know, Lane Davies and Jed Allen were such incredible, wonderful actors. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't get enough of Mason. I, I loved writing Mason. And of course, Mason repaid, uh, Lane repaid all the attention given to that character. Hmm. And you know, one of the things I um, always appreciated about soaps, and, and in a sense, I feel like I spent 40 years in a job I was absolutely not suited for, because I was never very fast. Um, but I also appreciated that, the you know, the, the heart of the soap is... Um, two people alone in a room and uh, what they say that nobody else can hear, we get to eavesdrop on. Mm -hmm. And I also believe, oh, but, that, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I also Those believe two. soaps are family stories more than they are romances. So that was another thing that I came from a big Irish Catholic family, as you might guess from my name. <laughs> um, so I love those big, I love the two persons are alone in a room scenes and I love those big dinner table scenes where everybody's there and somebody wants to, you to pass the dinner rolls and somebody else wants you to die or take back what you just said. It's true. I mean, I think those are the most powerful scenes is watching two people scenes or family. I mean, for me, I love, you know, I, it was the family, I think, dynamic that drew me in more than romance ever did. In fact, if you were to ask me that question again, now that I've thought of it, uh, about um, favorite dialogue yeah. uh, scripts that I've done, there was after Bridget and Jerry 
Dobson came back to uh, Santa, Santa Barbara. Barbara after the long legal fight there. Um, they asked me to do two episodes of a dinner party that they were doing at the Capwell home. And I thought those those episodes came out really, really well. And that was Gordon Thompson as Mason, and he was great, too. Well, I, I know that uh, one of the fans, Pierre Paolo, wanted me to ask you about that infamous Capwell dinner party. So it was great working for Bridget and Jerry. They they trusted me so much. That was uh, that was new for me. Um, you know, Douglas was very meticulous, and he had his own style, and he wanted things done his style. And I was glad to learn it. I, I didn't. I had nothing like his experience and talent to bring to the. Uh, table at the time. So I was happy to be a learner. Uh, but when I got on Santa Barbara, um, th that was so strange. I, I moved to, I actually met Marcy Walker before when she was moving to uh, California for Santa Barbara. I wrote this little play um, that somebody wanted to do uh, with uh, Harris Yulin in New York off Broadway. And the director was a friend of Mars. A anyway, I went there for this play reading that I was gonna do with the director. And there was this nice blonde woman there and um, paying attention, really appreciative of this play. And we read through the play a couple of times and I walked her home cause it was late at night. Uh, I, I walked her back to her stop, I guess. Um, and we were talking, she said her name was Marcy and she was going to take a job in um, Los Angeles um, on a new show called Santa Barbara. I said, oh, good for you. I didn't know she was like, um, I didn't ever watch all my children. Uh, but while we were walking down the road, somebody rolled down a, a car passed by and the, one of the windows rolled down and the person in the passenger seat yelled, Die, Liza, you bitch. <laughs> so I looked at her and she said, no, no, my name really is Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> and she explained to me about all my children. And, and that's how we got to be buddies. Oh, that's funny. Uh, so I, but I, at that point, I was disgusted with television. I didn't, I, I, I didn't hate any of the jobs that I'd done with Douglas, but all the all the courtships thereafter of me, people wanting me for jobs and then never hearing from them again, that just drove me crazy. So I thought I'm gonna go to San Francisco. I'm gonna move to San Francisco. And all right, not to learn how to be gay. I knew what the special clothes were by that time. <laughs> I'm glad you figured it uh, out. <laughs> you no, know, because I knew a few people there. And, and I'm gonna wait tables. So, and right place. So I get to New Orleans and I get to San Francisco and of course there's a restaurant strike on. I cannot, I cannot cross a picket line. I just can't. So I'm sitting there in my little studio apartment, figure trying to figure out what I'm going to do. The phone rings. It's Bridget. She said, how'd you like to write for Santa Barbara? I said, oh, I know somebody on that show. She <laughs> said, yeah, I know you. Uh, so she said, what do you want to write? I said, no, how about scripts? And she said, for how much? And I told her and she said, that's fine. You can start next Monday. So I didn't know why she thought had this high opinion of me. Did you ever find out? Well, I think they liked my work, but I, you know, I'm gonna have to say something, explain something I never did before. This was in the summer of 1984 mm -hmm. when I met Marcy. And I think it was September when I got that call from Bridget. And I said, I knew a few people in San Francisco. But shortly, I was not going to. They were already dead. And my friends in New York were dying. And it seemed like in the world, it seems like we were all going to be gone. And... I might not have wanted to keep writing 
for television, but I felt like I couldn't lose my health insurance. Uh. So that was in my head when Bridget called. Uh. I also felt like I already knew this was the wrong profession for me. I was too slow. I was too stubborn. I was too perfectionistic. But it was the work that was given to me. And damn it, I was going to do it. I was going to do it as well as I could do anything in my whole life because maybe that would be all I'd ever be able to do. Well, at that time in your life, in the 80s, getting that job at that moment must have really been a light. I mean, it must have helped to have, you know, some, first of all, the job, the insurance, but I would also say a little bit of a distraction at that time. It, it was not a distraction. I poured everything I had into every script because I didn't know how many of them I'd get to do. Right. Oh my God. So that, that was the thing that Bridget and Jerry responded to thought, holy shit, look what this guy is giving us. Oh, we didn't ask for this, but we want it now that we see that it's there. So I would get outlines from them that after notes meetings that they had at NBC with pages crossed out, just big X's on them. And then in the margin on page eight, it would say, Patrick, write something else. So they had this incredible faith in me to be able to do that. And I mean, that doesn't happen. Um, so that was really confidence building for me. And it also made me feel like this was not a bad move. Just deciding to take this job and stay in this work and because it's the work I've got and who knows how long I'll have it. This was a good thing to do. And I'm going to get it all out while I can. What are some of your favorite things that you did during that time at Santa Barbara? I think the, the Mason and Julia romance and the Eden and Cruz stories were Robin Matson and I, I loved Eden and Cruz. Um, and I loved Mason and Julia. I just, I gave them everything that I wanted to have in my own romantic life. Um, proceeding though from an understanding that their characters were not me. But they were mm -hmm. such good actors, my God. Oh, my God. The, the talent on that show and those two. Well, and I also love that, you know, I, I interviewed Jill Farron Phelps and they they were never it. meant they were never meant to be together. Like it was just let's see what happens after this weekend or I forget exactly how she described it. But it was their chemistry that just exploded that couple yeah i remember i i had written a scene um it was one of their first scenes together because eden was supposed to be this snooty rich girl and and cruise this sort of tough um smart cop and she walked into the room oh she was going to walk out of the room or something while he was talking to her and a martinez jumped and tackled her to the floor <laughs> in this scene. I thought, holy crap. <laughs> I didn't write that. They came up with that. Maybe Jill came up with that. But that, to me, that was the minute they became a couple. Yeah. They, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't not see those. You, you couldn't stop wanting to see those actors again. Um, Matthew Weaver, one of our viewers, says thank you to A. Martinez for suggesting you sit down with me. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I appreciate that, A. Martinez, and I appreciate you, Patrick, for doing this. And I really, more than anything, Patrick, I appreciate your honesty uh, about everything. Um, you know, another amazing actor that you wrote so much for, Justin Dees. Yeah. What was it like putting words into his mouth? It was a privilege. He 
Uh, maybe because I started out writing plays and working with actors and rehearsals and stuff, I on some shows I became the guy that you know if the actor had a complaint and wasn't just going to be told to shut up and do it, uh, which is so ignorant, but uh, they would talk to me. And Jill, for example, when we had, I, I loved that story that we did on, on Guiding Light, uh, Buzz coming back from being MIA. From oh, Vietnam. from Vietnam. Yeah. Um, he was so. And here we are talking about that on Veterans Day. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she said, she called and said, you know, Justin has a problem and he can't really explain it to me. And so would you talk to him? So I, we went out for dinner, Justin and I, and uh, he's a very uh, terse guy. He doesn't, he respects writers. He respected me, even though he called me that crazy gay guy in some soap opera magazine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he did not. <laughs> he, he did. It was fine. He knows I didn't care. Um, <laughs> but he appreciated me and I appreciated him. And so he kept saying um, he was he was smart as an actor about this because he didn't try to tell me what the answer was to the problem. He tried to describe the problem for me. And he basically said, I understand this. I understand that. But I don't understand the logic between this and that. Uh, he he understood why he um, came back to Springfield, and he understood staying away, but he doesn't understood what made him come back to Springfield. Um, and I I think I understood what he wanted, and I went home and wrote two um, episodes where that was addressed uh, with with the characters of Bud, Buzz and Nadine. Mm. And that was he did it beautifully. And I he if it I asked him if it solved the problem, he said, close enough. <laughs> so I guess that's a compliment from Justin. <laughs> yeah, he's just such a phenomenal powerhouse of an actor. I miss working with him. Oh, he he certainly was. That was one of the greatest characters, Buzz Cooper. <laughs> that was. That was a great time. Both times I was on Guiding Light. That show was impeccable. It was really good every single damn day. Mm -hmm. um, totally. And, you know, Nancy Curley and Douglas Marlin didn't have a lot in common as writers. Um, you know, mutual respect, certainly. But um, they both understood the show so well. Uh, Nancy, I, I spoke to as well. And fabulous wealth of ideas. You know, still to this day, <laughs> she was you know, spewing ideas for things she would have loved to have done. Yeah. 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 You, you wrote a brilliant script for Ross's election night dream, <laughs> but I do, I do hear that. I think it was edited in the final product. Um, if it's not too touchy, can you tell us, you know, your feelings on that? Oh no, I, I, it was a little bit different from what I wrote, but I, I just, that was another thing. At that point, Jill really trusted me too, and she just said we. She liked to do those standalone, one hours episodes devoted to one thing, one character, one story, whatever. So this was going to be Ross's election dream, and she basically said, "Do whichever you want." So I can't be too surprised that uh, it turned out to be a little different from what I had in mind. But I thought it played nicely. I, Jerry Verdorn really liked it. He years later he sought me out to tell me that. He, uh, another amazing actor. Yeah, you yeah. know I love that uh, story we did with him and Blake too. That was so much fun. Liz Kiefer was wonderful. Agreed. 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 Um, Playball NKY, a, a fan who's watching, says always knew a GL episode with the Mulcahy touch. Brilliant wordplay and strong emotions. Um, were were you responsible for the Ed and Ross conversations after Maureen's death? Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me. I love those shows. There were two shows that were right after Memorial uh, Maureen's memorial or something, and 
one of them had Ed and Ross out in the driveway. And Ed confides to Ross saying, I don't like it that she's out in the cold in the ground. If that's what he's talking about, yeah. yes, conversations yeah. were mine. But yeah. I say they were mine, but Peter Simon and Jerry Verdon, Ver everybody in those shows were on. Even Rachel Miner and the kids, those four, there were four kids. Oh, yeah, Ra Ra Rachel Miner and Brian Buffington and Greg Burke. It was Little Bill. Who was, who yeah, was I guess maybe it was three kids. Yeah, it was three. It was it was Michelle Bauer, Little Bill Lewis, and Ben Reed, Fletcher's son. And I so loved that they actually did the scene that I wrote for them. Um, Is that the I scene in the kitchen, I think? They were talking about, you know, Michelle was in a little bit of denial about whether her mother was really dead. Mm -hmm. And the and the boys were very seriously saying, you know, maybe she was just taken, you know, kidnapped, and she'll be back. And I, I, I'm not representing it well, but the scene played beautifully, and it it really represented that sort of. Uh, and the kids played it this way, it, it, that sort of um, stunned incredulity that children can have in the face of of death a death yeah and they played it so real those kids they were great right. and they're they still they're still you know friends to this day so it's really it's great to to see that who you know if you look back i mean you've worked at so many shows i know we've talked about uh you know ross and blake and buzz and and eden and Cruz. Can you, any other characters that you truly loved writing for during your time at Guiding Light in Santa Barbara? Others that we haven't mentioned? Um, I loved writing for Melissa Hayden. I loved ah. Jane Carroll as Nadine and Melissa Hayden was Bridget. We yeah. had such a good cast then. It was amazing. Um, I was maybe not so... Uh, attuned to the acting the first time around when I was on Guiding Light with Douglas, but I, I got more, uh, and certainly Beverly McKenzie, boy, there was nobody like her. She would, she memorized everything down to the commas and made it sound like Shakespeare every damn day. She was amazing. And, and she, um, she would learn it on a Sunday, the entire week. She would learn it. She would learn from Friday backwards. She taught, a lot of other actors. She would learn all her lines on Sunday. I what was it know, like to watch somebody like her, you know, use your lines, you know, read your, you know, act your lines? <laughs> it feels, uh, I remember the first time I had a play produced, I thought, this feeling, this should be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> um, the secret that those people are, I'm speaking through those people. Yeah. Did, you get, to, just, um, did you get to write much for Kim Zimmer? No, Kim Zimmer was not on the show when I, when I was at Guiding Light. She had just left and I think she came back just after I left myself. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I did not write for her. Um, Maeve Kincaid, of course, was uh, reliably wonderful always. Yeah, I, I liked the Maeve Kincaid. I liked the Vanessa Chamberlain that uh, Douglas had created. She was a little more grown up and wiser by the time uh, I came back to the show. So she yes. wasn't as full of her and Nola were fantastic during Doug's time. Yes. Their, their rivalry was phenomenal. Oh, and Lord, that Lisa Brown, could she act? Man. <laughs> yes, she could. Yes, she, she could. She could break your heart and make you furious, at, you know, within the course of five minutes. Yeah, seriously. She's another one I, I had. To get. I had total strangers offer me money. Um if I would say that we would make Nola fall down the stairs and die. 
<laughs> wow. I, I read um, an interview you did with Nelson Branco and you talked about the voices in your head. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I do hear, you know, if you ask any writer where they start, some, some will say, I get a, I have a sentence, I have an idea. I, for me, it's like somebody talking and I, I'm listening and I start writing down what they're saying. Uh, this was a problem for me back in the uh, bad old days of the psych ward because they asked me, do you hear voices? I said, oh yeah, bad idea. They weren't telling me what to do. They just, but of course then they thought I was really psychotic and- Right, yes. But they no, would think that today, said you know, <laughs> as well. But back then, I'm sure a lot worse. Well, I think prob I hope there's a little more awareness that it's an occupational hazard for writers, but especially writers for theater and and uh, performance. But I, I really I have the uh, greatest respect for acting. I did enough of it myself to know I'm terrible at it. Um, but I also know when somebody's got the gift, I can, I, I can see it. And it's, that's a gift that uh, is without age, like a little, um, geez, that sounds uh, condescending, but Rain Edwards, who really was 17 when she came on Bold and the Beautiful, what a magnificent uh, development as an actor we got to watch when she was on that show, she was so wonderful. She was so good. She was so honest. Marcy had that, that honest thing. She, if you wrote her wrong, she just couldn't do it. She just hmm. couldn't fake it. Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of young, like Melissa Hayden as well. I think she's like, oh, Melissa, like was, Melissa was yeah. great. Such Melissa a young character great. who was in trouble all the time. Yeah. Uh, Candace uh, has two questions. What advice would you give to a young, inspiring soaper, soap writer? I don't have a lot of uh, optimism about the future of broadcast soap operas. So I would preface anything by saying that, but there are um, people making serial uh, programming off network. Um, right. One of the ones that I, uh, is, I think it's on Amazon now though too. There, there were two that I thought were just wonderful. One was called East Siders. Uh, and one was called Conversations in L.A. And they were both beautifully written and produced. Um, East Siders might be a little gay for some people, but uh, for gay people, it's not too gay. It's not uh, too gay. No. And, and But it was also just really well done. Good actors, good writing. And I would say the same about Conversations in L.A. I have not seen some of the more recent ones. I just, it's not out of any dislike of them or mm -hmm. uh, I just, I, I haven't seen them, but I would try to, for an, uh, somebody who wanted to write for soaps, I would try to hitch my wagon to somebody who wanted to produce that kind of serialization, whether it's on YouTube or Amazon or some other place, stream. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, then her other question was, um, is there a storyline or what storyline would you redo if you had the opportunity? From what you've written. All of them, no, not all of them. Um, Were you very critical of yourself along the way? Well, in, uh, in soaps, Nobody uh, 
at my station, no scriptwriter, for example, or outline writer gets to call the story, gets to say what the story is going to be. There's somebody else whose job that is, and that person is usually informed by four or five other people, plus the network, plus the Procter and Gamble or whoever is producing. Yeah. So the the ownership is sort of shared, um, maybe less so on Bold and the Beautiful than any place else that I've been, because Brad is the uh, Brad is the captain of that ship. Um, so he gets to, uh, his, his vision is the one that gets uh, serviced. And he, he does that uh, as well as it, it can probably be done by one person. Huh. Um, I didn't like a lot of the stories on Santa Barbara, particularly after the Dobsons were gone. Um, and here I want to own that I have occasionally been really sort of awful to the head writers that I worked for. I never got fired for it, but I probably, not saying that I should have been fired, but I, I should have apologized sooner. I was terrible to Ann Howard Bailey. She was a nice lady, but I didn't like what she was doing to Santa Barbara. I didn't think she knew the show. I was editing at the time, I think. At some point in there, I was editing. And I would get on the phone with the script writers at the beginning of the week and say, okay, I know what the outlines say, but here's what we're going to do instead. <laughs> so poor Ann Howard Bailey was probably not getting to see much of what she was actually writing, although we had to use the sets and so on that she was uh, employing. But she never, she never, um, she never squawked too much. Mm -hmm. Jackie Smith squawked a lot, but uh, you know Richard Carlton was another one. I don't think I was very nice to him on General Hospital. Um, there was another situation where it seemed like all the things that we'd started with Guza um, were getting um, run off the rails, and so uh, a bunch of us writing scripts kind of concentrated on keeping the show, the show that we had known. Did you so I don't think I should not have been. I should not have been that difficult. You had strong opinions. It's you know. It sounds like you you were passionate about what you you were writing. That's what it I sounds did. like. And as I told you early on, one of my first lessons was: do not say you're okay with writing material that's not okay. Mm -hmm. I may have taken that a bit too far. Okay, I'm, but, well, that, but that's a good lesson really... for Candace, who's who's listening. You know, for yeah, any yeah. writers, don't you know? Don't be okay. You know, challenge. You know, there is be a way to challenge, but you don't need to be as abrasive as I could have been at some times. Okay. Did I you create not... the character of Carly on General Hospital? <laughs> no, I think uh, technically that was Bob that created uh, Bob. Guza created Carly um, as, as, uh, as Jackie's, um, what was it? Bobby's daughter um, yeah. coming in to be a spoiler. But uh, for a long time, she was hanging around. And this is actually good strategy when you're bringing on a new character to have the character hang around and not do anything too definitive uh, right away until the audience gets used to seeing the character and is interested in the character. But I got um, impatient. It was obvious we had a we had lightning in a bottle with the actor. Uh, Sarah who, Joy, Sarah yes, Brown. Sarah Brown was incredible. Um, and so I started making decisions for the character, which maybe is how the people got the idea that I created her. I didn't, but um, I did sort of drag her forward. And Bob Guza, my friend, is an excellent manager of writers, by which I mean he knows when to get out of the way when a, when a writer has a good idea. And he hmm. let me go with it. In fact, you know, when I first came on General Hospital, Claire Labine was just leaving and Bob was just coming on. He and I knew each other from Santa Barbara, so um, he was... Uh, engineered me coming on to General Hospital. 
And one of the first, I don't know, eight shows that I wrote was the famous Clink Boom episode where uh, Brenda was marrying Jax at the exact same time that Lily was, Sonny's wife Lily was being blown up by a car bomb. Do you remember that? Or anyway, some of the, some of the people. I'm sure asked, the fans will. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was not a general hospital person back then. And Bob gave it to me to write. And I looked over what he had outlined. And I called him and said, Bob, I just don't know. I don't know. This is, uh, I, this doesn't make sense to me. He'd been working at getting this going for, I don't know, months. And I, uh, working on this moment, working exactly the way it was supposed to for months. And I'm calling up and saying, I don't know. I don't, I'm not feeling it. And you know what he said to me? You do what you think is right. You go ahead and do it the way you think it ought to be. It seems like you got that from a lot of people. Trust. Maybe not all, but definitely a good good amount that you worked for. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I was lucky that way. And of course, you know, I went back to the outline and looked at it again and tried to play around with it and realized it was exactly the way it should be already. And so I just wrote it the way that he had it. And it was great. It was a very interesting episode. It was kicked off a lot of different stories. Well, that yeah. character still kicking butt today, you know, with Laura Wright on John Hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Character of Carly. Um, is there a character or characters that you really struggled writing for over the years? I guess Sonny might be one. Um, <laughs> I remember one of my first General Hospital scripts. I uh, I guess I thought I was still writing Santa Barbara. I, I handed in <laughs> a, a, a script uh, was editing, and it, I, there was a big scene with Sonny where he had a long speech. And so I got the, Michelle is a great editor. So I got the script back. It, it, they used to show us the edited scripts, and so you'd see what the editor wrote. And Michelle got rid of most of the speech. And um, I called her up and I said, can you tell me exactly what did not work here for you? And she said, Sonny's just not that smart. <laughs> 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 and you know, that was a really useful, um, that was a really useful note to get. And I, I think I, she really helped me find the, the characters I found difficult to write on General Hospital. Of course, one was Luke because God knows what the, the actor would actually do, no matter what you wrote. Um, and the first thing, oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it. The first thing a, a General Hospital writer learned in those days was never write a kiss between Luke and Laura. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will let you figure out yeah. the, the yeah. underpinning of that for yourself. Um, <laughs> Understood. But we had we were blessed with a great producer there, Wendy uh, Rich, who was just really, really excellent at doing the thing you want a producer to do: to produce the damn show. Um, and you know, she 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 and Bob were kind of oil and water, and she because she questioned everything she would those notes meetings for on the outlines would last all day and bob would just get tearing his hair out you know mentally not physically mm -hmm. and um but once that was over it was set in stone wendy would not let anyone change anything from getting that story on the air huh. but there were a lot of uh there were a Certainly a lot of egos to manage at General Hospital at that point. Well, speaking and, of uh, Luke and Laura, yeah. this Wednesday, next Wednesday, November 17th, is 41-year anniversary of their wedding. It's crazy. Yeah. Not crazy, crazy. I read a quote um, of yours that you said, Today, I for one am convinced that the lives we present in daytime serials resemble less and less the lives of anyone watching it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it has become that? Um, 
I think that the, the easiest way to explain what I meant for that is that the executives don't base their ideas of drama, network executives now, broadcast networks, don't base their idea of what drama is or should be on the lives of real people. They base it on other dramas that they've seen on TV. And, you know, some of them are pretty old and pretty uh, uh, sterile. Mm. Um, but people didn't get mad at them. So I think that's like a huge uh, research has been a, 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 a curse and a blessing for television because um, you get focus groups together and they'll say, I don't like that. I don't like him. He's terrible. And but they mean they're, they're responding to the character the way that you want them to, but that will tell the executives like, oh, we can't show that person anymore, or we should show that person less, or make that person nice. No. So that's all very difficult to figure out. Um, yeah, I, think, I, I think we all watched soaps because it, 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 it did, you know, when they started, it resembled real people, real lives, real things that were happening to people. Well, then we got Gloria Monti and the Ice Princess and General Hospital and Cassid Mines, and they are not like real people. And that was so successful ratings-wise, everybody wanted that. They didn't know exactly what was making it work. So they say things like, well, let's have a... a, a Let's have a sequence where they're, the people are running away and they dance in a department store because Luke and Laura had done that. Um, that's not how it works, folks. You got to start with your characters where they are. You can't just suddenly have them grow curly hair and become Luke and Laura. Mm -hmm. And as a, a lot of our fans are commenting right now, focus groups ruined soaps and focus groups killed Maureen Bauer. Well, focus groups are kind of unfocused, if you ask me. They, they, <laughs> they, they find people who um, don't work, uh, who never miss the show, and pay them for their opinions. So they get in the room, and they feel like they have to have an opinion, and particularly even about things they never thought about before once they're asked. And it's often about, you know, haircuts, um, <laughs> hairdos, um, how a character dresses. Uh, and when they say they don't like something, it takes a, a, a smart researcher and a smart executive to understand what is exactly meant by that. Yeah, nobody liked um, Roger Thorpe, maybe, when he was a, a supervillain, <laughs> but he made everything happen and and he made people tune in he did for sure that absolutely guy very, he's one of uh, the, one of the only i think there was there have been two actors who actually mentioned me by name when they won their emmys and one of and, them was, and was michael zaslow for sure is one of them that is correct that is correct patrick before we say goodbye today tell us about the other patrick in your life uh well his um, he's a Cajun. He and he can really cook, man. Oh, uh, he nice. uh, is from the bayous of Louisiana, and um, his mom named him Patrick. And then when we got married, he took my last name. So we are two Patrick Mulcahy's living together peacefully, um, except when we have to go to the airport and and uh, go through TSA. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be a sight to see. Um, I assume he's not in the same business as you. Is he a writer? No, he was a he was a nine one one dispatcher in San Francisco when we met, um, and had, oh, wow. had done that for quite a while. Very stressful job. I mean, I thought my job was stressful, but you know, he's um, on the phone with some guy threatening to jump off a window for an hour and a half. Oof. And then the police um, 
mediator takes over and he never knows what happened. Wow. Does he, he watch has, the television show 911? No. No, he does not want to revisit that. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Life. I assume he was very good at it. They got him, the, the uh, city of San Francisco gave him several awards and citations for meritorious service. Um, but now he grows our food. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, That's we got awesome. like a hundred pounds of tomatoes and squashes and uh, potatoes and garlic. Uh, sounds, sounds, sounds delicious. Are you writing currently? I am. I am. I uh, have a screenplay that I want to finish. I have uh, a series idea that I'm also working on. And then I have these, you know, when I quit B&B uh, &B in 2019, I thought I was going to go from the stage again, and that didn't work out because the theaters were all closed. Um, so I did get uh, connected to uh, a guy named Roland Tech, who ran runs a... Um, workshops for writers based at which he framed uh, during the pandemic as being about writing dramatic monologues. And he's a very smart guy. He knows that a monologue is not the same. A dramatic monologue is you got to get something from somebody or you have a, an outcome that you desire um, that you're trying to make happen dramatically. And so he runs a little contest. I won it two years in a row, actually. Well, the first year I won first prize. The sec this year I won second prize. And Allie Mills uh, performed the piece for me. She was great. Uh, you know, Allie Mills from... Um... Oh, so yeah. I expanded one of those monologues into a, uh, like a one show of five monologues, five different characters played by the same actor, which I think will be... Uh, interesting. Well, keep, keep up the great work, Patrick. Really, thank you so much for doing this. Fans, you know, hope hope we do it again because your your storytelling is phenomenal. Well, thank you. I feel like I uh, got off the subject a bit for you. Thank you for your indulgence and for the patience of people listening to. Absolutely. You take care of yourself and we'll stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, Bye, Pat. Bye, Patrick. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, Patrick has stories for days. Uh, Patrick, thank you so much for spending the time and, and your honesty. Don't miss tomorrow's show when Rich Burns and Trevor LaPaglia join me here to discuss their new web series, The Disappointments. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't. Turn on the notifications down below so you get reminders of all upcoming shows. Have a great afternoon, everybody, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.